This podcast contains strong language and adult themes. Listener's discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome to A Page Too Far, the show where each week one of us reads a book and tells the other all about it. Will it be bad? Will it be good? Let's find out. My name is Jason Voorhees, and this is my co-host... Because he killed him. It's true. It's true. I really want to know what my face looked like when I did that. It it was pretty entertaining, I'm not going to lie. Uh, this week's book is The Turn of the Screw. Ooh, The Taming of the Shrew. By, by Henry James. His name is Henry James? His name is Henry James. Okay, first off, Henry James is not a full name. There needs to be a third name right. there. Like Henry James Potter. It's two first names, that's a problem. Yeah, well, it's Harry James Potter, but still. Uh, and then, yeah, it's two first names, you can't trust them. Exactly. Um, this is a gothic horror book. I don't believe you. I can't trust him. <laughs> and it was published in 1898. 1898. This is the oldest book we have done so far. Interesting. By like 20 years. Yeah. It, it, this is an old fucking book. Uh, a lot of people probably recognize this book. It's a pretty well-known book. It is considered to be one of the godfathers of gothic horror. I see. Um, there's, there's a shit ton of inspiration in like all horror books from this book, right? Is Dracula considered gothic horror? Mm, like what I'm what defines sure, gothic actually. horror as opposed to gothic horror means that the horror is really a metaphor oh so while in gothic horror there are literal ghosts yeah those ghosts are just a representation of a an issue you have that you're externalizing so uh if i'm understanding this right then like a haunting on hill house with the the uh yes. the tall man that's a that's, is, is yeah a, a, among the other ones but the tall man specifically is one where it really shoves it down your throat yeah, and that that's based on uh, a book called the the haunted house uh, or the haunted hill house, whatever. It's, it's the similar, haunting of hill house. Yeah, similar title, but yeah, no, mm-hmm. that's also based on a gothic horror novel. I see. Um, but yeah, no, that's that that's the essence of gothic horror, which is because uh, Dracula's like he's a literal vampire, right? Yeah, no, it is actually something going yeah, on. Yeah, but in gothic horror, usually deals with ghosts, where it's like I see. I, I'm seeing this this horrible thing. But, oh my God, that's just what I look like inside. Okay. It's okay. that sort of thing. I got gotcha. you. I, I like it. Some people think it's really pretentious, but I, that's my favorite genre I could, of horror. I could see it being pretentious, but that's, very, that's a very interesting take. Yeah, because I, I, I love the parallels and like you, because it gives you something to figure out, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. What is exactly going yeah, on? Yeah. And when someone admits something, it just clicks into place and you're like, oh, yeah. Right. That's, that's cool. Right. Uh, the book is 146 pages long. Okay, that's solid. It's, yeah, fair amount. Yeah. So listeners may be familiar with a Netflix show uh, called The Haunting of Bly Manor. The sequel to Hill House. Yes, it was the second season. Right. Um, they're, they're not related, the first and second season. It's just, right, yeah, know, same cast, same writers, different, different scenarios. Yeah, they're both written by Mike Flanagan, who's mm-hmm. a fucking genius as far as I'm concerned. I love him. Uh, and so listeners may recognize pretty much everything in this story because that show that season of that show was an adaption of this novel oh very interesting yes so okay if you've seen haunting a Bly manor that's this book yeah so there's uh, i mean the ending is different i'm kind of glad i didn't watch it then <laughs> yep there you go yeah um i mean the ending is different but there's a there's a lot that's similar so um they be familiar the turning of the screw the book begins uh in the prologue with a small group of people in an old house on Christmas Eve. Oh. And they're listening to each other's ghost stories. Oh. That was a thing, right? That was a thing. Back uh, when people first really started celebrating Christmas, it was traditional around uh, the, oh, what do you call it, the winter solstice, mm-hmm. to sit around the fire and tell ghost stories. That's why um, the Christmas Carol is very ghost themed. Yeah. No, that's exactly why there's ghosts in the Christmas Carols, because that's what Christmas was about, was spookiness. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent of bringing that back. And if I have, if I ever have kids, yeah, that's a tradition I'm going to I'll fucking force on my kids. Very nice. I'm going to scare the shit out of you before <laughs> Santa comes. Uh, so the relationships between these people are pretty vague. Uh, we, okay. we get that they're they're pretty friendly. So I'm guessing they're just friends and acquaintances. All right. Uh, some of them are married to each other. It's men and women. Okay. Okay. 
Mixed group. Um, it, they don't seem to be family, but that's not out of the question. I just got the feeling they were friends. Um, it's not really that important. Yeah. Most of them uh, don't have names. Um, it's just said, you know, someone says this and mm-hmm. the other person mm-hmm. responds. We experienced the book initially through the perception of one of these people at this at this party. Uh, he's a man. Okay. He doesn't have a name. Oh, we call him Tim. Uh, Tim notices that <laughs> uh, he notices that Douglas Ooh. seems to be unaffected by the stories. Oh, come on, and Douglas. Get in with it. He's deep in his own thoughts. When it comes time for him to tell a ghost story, he stares into the fire and says that he has a story that he's never told anyone, but that it is too dreadful to tell. Wait, I mean, okay. First off, <laughs> bullshit. Second yeah. off, you don't say that Just in say this scenario. Yeah, you don't have a story. <laughs> you don't say that you have a story that is too scary to tell unless you're setting the stage baiting people. for a dramatic yeah. reversal. I think that's what he did is doing. Is he's, he's just setting, a drama queen. Yeah, he's setting the stage for a fantastic story. Yeah. Right? Uh, the others beg him to tell the story. Naturally. He says that uh, it is written down in a journal, but that journal is far away, locked in a drawer. Oh. Why'd you bring it up then? Yeah. Like, you literally can't tell the story, apparently. So, like... <laughs> Look, I have this story I've never told anyone. Well, will you tell us? No. See, it's written down in this journal, but it's like, I mean, it's it's across the hall. Yeah, like, like, I'd have to get up and get it. I don't really know the story. I just have it. Uh, uh, whatever. Uh, they plead with him to go get it. Or send for it through the post. Sure. Because it's like in a town over or something like that. He agrees uh, to send for it, uh, but he tells them that it will take some time and they'll have to wait at least a few days. What kind of spoils it? Uh, well, they're all hyped. They're all I mean, like, yeah. that sounds awesome. We'll actually stick around longer so we can hear your story. And the person whose house it is is like, no, no, yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, wait, what? No. Exactly. I didn't buy enough food for this. Uh, he talks briefly. This is still the same moment here. He talks briefly about the woman who gave him the journal almost 40 years ago. Oh. She was his sister's governess. Okay. And 10 years his senior. Okay. They banged. Well, he implies heavily uh, that he had been in love with her, but that she had been in love with someone else. Oh. Uh, Anyways, everyone looks forward to hearing the story Thursday night. So time passes. Mm -hmm. The night comes and Douglas begins the story. His old friend, the governess, yes. was 20 years old when she answered the advertisement for a caretaking position. She meets and is interviewed by the man who posted it. Mm-hmm. A gentleman, both charming and wealthy. Oh. He is described in the book as gallant and splendid. Check and check. He explains to her that he had become the guardian of his niece and nephew. Their names are Flora and Miles. I was hoping to be Fauna. <laughs> <laughs> After the sudden death of their parents in India, mm-hmm. he is their only surviving relative, which is why he has guilt guardianship. Over this them. is just like a series of unfortunate events vibes. Yeah, a little bit. The gentleman moved them into one of his estates in the countryside. Oh, one of. Okay. Uh, it's called Bly Manor. Nice. Uh, okay. There it is. There we go. Yeah. Uh, he spared what servants he could to look after the children and take care of the manor. Nice. Maybe sell one of your estates and get some more servants. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, He visits them when he is able, but most of the time he is too taken up by his own business affairs. Yeah, naturally. Um, I mean, he's super wealthy, so he's obviously doing shit. Well, his business affairs, I I, I have no concept of how business was run back in the day. Right. In my mind, they are sitting in a club that is meant for men only. Yeah. (laughs) That like a Diogenes club Mm -hmm. that you can't speak in. And everyone is just signing document after document and just making money. Business, uh, business, Like, I signed 10 pages today. I made 20,000 pounds. Yeah, something like that. He's This this guy is kind of a mysterious character. Yeah. He's just really wealthy. He has to take care of his niece and nephew, but he really doesn't care about them and he doesn't have the time. Right? Yeah, yeah. Also, being a lifelong bachelor, he had no experience taking care of children. Sure. So he doesn't even know what to do. I mean, that's fair. Do you need a newspaper in the corner? Like... (laughs) Leave out some kibble. I'll just come by and check it every now and then. Uh, The governess uh, would be hired to live in the manor. Naturally. And act as a tutor and surrogate mother to the children. So she's hired to be a governess. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Just in case nobody knew what that was. Yeah. uh, yeah, Just take care of kids. I know. The gentleman explains that the children had had a governess already, Mm -hmm. uh, but but that she had died unexpectedly. Oh. There were other staff on the estate, uh, two housemaids, a cook, a dairy woman, an old groom, an old gardener, and a pony. 
Do Pony considered staff? I wouldn't consider it staff, but it says that. So Okay, <laughs> nice. Uh, she could have the job on one condition. Ooh. That she never, ever see nor speak to him again. All right. Am I still going to be paid for this? Yes. She'll, she'll be paid. Sure. Fine. Cause, done. Cause he has, he has people to do that. For yeah. Him. Um, but that's the condition. All right. Don't, don't come to see me. Don't speak to me. Don't write to me. I better not know you exist from this point out. Just do your job. That's fair. That's totally fair. I, for me, that's fair. So yeah. sure. Why not? I don't know if that's kind of weird in society back then, but I, I'd do that. Um, I mean, Personally, I would I would just think like oh, that's weird, but who cares? Yeah, like I'm fine with that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm fine with never talking to my boss. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, the governess hesitates out of fear of the mysterious death of the previous governess. Naturally, because no explanation was given. He just said she's dead. Oh, huh. and the isolation of the estate. It's way out in the countryside. Oh, it's I pretty see. Far from any real towns. There's a village nearby, but it's not much. You know, there's like a post office. Yeah. And a bakery, and that's it. <laughs> a church. Uh, it would be lonely and dull work for her. I mean, you haven't even met the kids yet. I mean... In a position like that, the kids are what make it, right? Uh, mm, mm, mm. I feel like you need friends that aren't work colleagues. And out there, yeah. she wouldn't really have any friends. That's true. And she wouldn't be able to leave the house for any reason, so... Man, in here in year of our Lord 2021, people are doing that voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> but the job paid too well. And after a second interview, she accepts the offer. Nice. Uh, so this is where the prologue ends. And this is where we actually jump into the story. Ooh. From this point on, uh, everything is from the perspective of the governess. Okay. okay. That makes sense. When the governess arrives at Bly, she is met at the door by Mrs. Gross, one of the maids. And Flora, the younger of the two children. I'm, I'm not going to make a comment on that. It's too low hanging. <laughs> Mrs. Gross? Yeah. It's a little weird. Maybe it's Grosse. Like French. Is it G-R-O-S-E? Yeah. I would say gross. I would say gross too. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Flora is like eight or nine. Okay. And Miles is 10. Does she have long, straight black hair that hangs over her face down to her waist? No, she actually has blonde hair. Oh. But it is long. Right? Okay. Uh, she's a blonde, blue, blue-eyed cutie. Aw. Flora was beautiful and exceptionally charming little girl. Her brother, Miles, was currently at boarding school and would return at the end of the week. The I- ideal situation for a governess. Hey, take yeah. care of these kids. One of them is going to be gone for half a year. Yeah, that's nice, right? The first night, the governess hears what almost sounds like a child crying somewhere in the manor. Was it a child crying? Uh, no. Okay. She checked on the floor and she wasn't crying. Uh, and she thought she heard light footsteps Ooh. just outside of her door. All right. So she chalks it up to, it's a big old house. Yeah, there's going to be weird noises. Yeah. The following day, she spends her time getting to know Flora, and Flora gives her a tour of the entire house. Oh. The governess marvels at Flora's cheerful and courageous demeanor when showing her the old and crooked rooms and hallways of Bly Manor. Because she's like, this place is creepy as fuck. It's old. It's dusty. Yeah. But this little girl is like, we're prancing through Candyland. She's just optimistic to the max. Right. Well, she lives there. Yeah, it's also her house. <laughs> so, yeah, it's different. It's different being the outsider and it's different than actually living there. Like, I'm right. sure if you lived in a, like, if you, if you worked at a haunted, uh, haunted house, for example, mm-hmm. doesn't have the same spooky factor. In the post, the governess receives a letter from Miles' headmaster, which had been forwarded to her by her employer. Oh. So I guess the headmaster sent it to the uncle. And he was like, oh, not my department. Exactly. It's like, none of my business threw it to, I mean, it is, but yeah, fuck that. <laughs> it is, but he hired somebody for that. Exactly. The letter notified them that Miles would be expelled from the school Ooh. for unacceptable behavior. Okay. But the letter did not clarify or give any details as to how or why. Well, that's not helpful. No. How do you rectify behavior? Uh, exactly. Yeah, I would immediately write him and be like, the fuck you talking about, bro? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> This news seems to distress Mrs. Gross. Well, yeah. Um, And she had known the kids since they were babies. So she has this attachment to them, right? Mm -hmm. And she asks the governess to reserve judgment until she has met Miles herself. He really is a sweet kid. Right. Because that's what what she says exactly. It's like, my boy wouldn't misbehave. Like, no way. That sort of thing. I'm sure she had that Southern accent, too. (laughs) I I want her to. Um, (laughs) She might. We don't know. The, uh, in the, in the show, The Haunting of Bly Manor, the main character who was played by the same actress as Nell from the, the Haunting of Hill House. Which one's Nell? The one who killed herself. Okay. She's like the really cute one. Yeah. That's how I remember. <laughs> All right. 
The bent neck one. The really good actress. Let me put it that way. Gotcha. <laughs> she she plays... Not the one whose husband dies from an aneurysm. Uh, yes, that one. Same oh, one. it is that one. Same one, yeah. That's right. And then she does... Okay, yeah, yeah. that's right. So uh, so anyways, uh, she plays the governess in The Haunting of Bly Manor. And she has, okay. she has a very southern accent. Okay. So I just think of the governess as having... <laughs> <laughs> right. Southern right. accent. Um, uh, the governess asks her if Miles has had a penchant for misbehaving, uh, but she states that Miles is just as well-mannered as Flora. Hmm. Uh, the governess doubts that the headmaster would expel him for no reason. Right. And she presses Mrs. Gross for answers. She infers that the previous governess knew something about Miles' behavior before she died. I see. And so she asks Mrs. Gross about the previous governess. Right. Uh, she learns that uh, the previous governess had actually left Bly of her own accord. Oh. She she didn't die necessarily. She left. Okay. Uh, and never came back. Didn't leave a note. Didn't talk to anybody. She just left. Just disappeared. And the uncle, the employer, yeah. uh, had simply told everyone that she was dead. Um, I, I have <clears throat> I have several thoughts about that. Okay. Um. First off, there's the joke, right? Which is like, you're dead to me because yeah. you're leaving. I'm never going to see you again. This doesn't matter. Right. But to actually tell people that someone is dead after they've left your employee, mm-hmm. unless they're actually dead, really sus. Uh, that and plus like, it, it's also just kind of assumed by everybody because like nobody saw her ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's, it, it's not like she left and she's living happily somewhere and he's just lying to everybody. Right. He might be right. He might be right, <laughs> but he also might be incredibly wrong in that maybe something happened and she's distancing herself and she doesn't want to see anybody again. Maybe. Because they're all she's seen for the last X amount of time she's worked there. She's just sick of them. Exactly. You fucking bastards. <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't, like, if I was in her position, however I'm leaving that job, whether on good terms, bad terms, my terms, whatever. Right. I'm not moving to the next village. Right. I'm moving to the next continent. So at the end of the week. Yeah. Uh, the governess takes a carriage to pick up Miles. Nice. Uh, and I guess he got a carriage to the little village and there was an inn. So he just waited there. And okay. Then and then went she to went the to go inn. pick him up. Sure. Yeah. When she meets him, he appears to have the same air of sweetness and gentleness as Flora. Oh, he's so cute. Uh, the, the governess goes on and fucking on about <laughs> how perfect these kids are. There couldn't possibly be anything wrong with them. Yeah. I, I like it, it was baffling to me how, how many words you could use to describe children as just being perfect. Well, this is the era of writing, too, where people are overly descriptive. Right. Right. I mean, every, every book that I've ever read mm-hmm. pre-1950 has the same flaws. Right. And I mean, there, there's some parts of this book where she'll just throw out something and I'm like, whoa, whoa, talk about that. That was really interesting. That was two sentences. That could have been a whole chapter. Yeah, exactly. Um, but and then, but she, a lot of the book is her inner thoughts. Right. And how she feels about things. Right. And what should she do about things and how perfect the kids are. <laughs> so huh. I'm curious if she's consistent. That's something I'm going to kind of keep an eye out for. Um, she seems consistent to me. Okay. Um, but since there's so much internal monologue, yeah. there's a lot I just don't mention. Yeah. Um, but she does that a lot. So Miles is just as Mrs. Gross described. Mm-hmm. Just a perfect little angel. On the ride back to Bly, the governess is merely bewildered. She didn't know what to think of the letter she had received. She apologized to Mrs. Gross for not believing her and decided to ignore the letter for the time being. <laughs> um, okay. He would continue his studies at Bly with her. All right. right. That was what she was hired for. So homeschooled. Yeah. Time kind of skips around a little bit. Yeah. Um, And it's usually like the next day when something happens. So I'm going to try to keep up with this, but uh, this is kind of the next day. While walking the grounds of the estate, she sees a strange man standing on top of one of the towers at the corner of the manor, Hmm. staring at her. Mm -hmm. Now, this tower is like a castle turret. Sure. It's got an open top with a little sectional things with slots in between them and uh, this man is standing at the very top just staring down at her i see palisades i guess it's said in the book but it was a word i'd never seen before yeah and i didn't write there's it down. there's a name for those specific yeah. things that i didn't i refuse to remember say levy she did not recognize him at all right has she met all the staff at this point yes okay she's met everyone and everyone and anyone that is on the grounds or comes to the grounds right she met the pony she met the pony <laughs> 
she so she didn't recognize him at all. He definitely wasn't a member of the staff Mm -hmm. or anybody she had met in town. She realized that while they stared at each other, all the sounds of birds or wind just fell silent around her. Oh, that's interesting. And he's like, hey, how's it going? He said that? No, he doesn't say that. I'm just saying, that's a joke. Okay, okay. (laughs) I'm just picturing a staring contest. Basically, no, they just stare at each other intently. But after a minute of this, uh, the strange man steps backwards from the ledge of the tower and out of sight. Mm-hmm. All the while, not breaking his gaze from her. Well, that's creepy. She also makes a, a fucking, she also makes a note here where she says, and he wasn't even wearing a hat. Oh, which, <laughs> oh, why I do declare. <laughs> which, it, I mean, this is a thing. Back in the 1800s, if you were not wearing a hat, people just assumed something was wrong. They were like, are, are you hurt? What, well, what's going on? What's wrong? It's like, just, it's hot out. It's just, I mean, it I was... Just, very, very, very unusual. My head's hot. <laughs> Men and women to be outside without a hat. That's very interesting. So this experience kind of shakes her up a little bit. Well, yeah. <laughs> Naturally. Uh, she feels confused, curious, and kind of dread all at once. I would ask somebody. Uh, she supposes that the man might be an insane, unmentionable relative confined to the tower. That does happen in books like this. That's It's a long time ago, so that's a possibility. Except he's clearly not confined because he can walk up onto the turret. But, but if he can walk up onto the turret, he could leave. Well, no, there's no way down from the turret. There is. There are several ways down from that well, turret. you could fall. You could climb. I, mm, I, mm-hmm. mm, if you're determined enough. They're pretty sheer. I don't know. I mean, we don't know that. We're, we can't see it. She eventually writes it off as a mere intruder who had not the discretion to avoid being witnessed. Maybe tell somebody. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe tell anybody. Maybe ask somebody. Uh, She begins locking her door at night just in case. That's fair. She hasn't hasn't told anybody yet. (laughs) But I still agree with that. Um, Over the next few days, she thinks about the letter from Miles' headmaster. Uh Uh-huh. She can't believe that such an innocent-minded boy could have been acting wickedly. If he was misbehaving at school, he would surely be misbehaving at home. Not necessarily. Yeah, no, I definitely, I was like, I mean, he could just be putting on a front for you. Yeah. That's, that happens a lot. Totally. Uh, she decides that Miles is too fine and fair for the school world, and the headmaster must have been acting vindictively. God, I, uh, that's not a commentary in the state of our educational system today. <laughs> I mean, I will say, it's a male author. Yeah. From the late 1800s. Yeah. He could just be like, this is just how women are. Maybe. <laughs> they're just, Maybe. They're stupid. I, yeah. I don't know. On Sunday, it rained so hard, they could not attend morning church service. Oh, man. That's pretty hard. Yeah. For, I mean, fucking, my mom wouldn't care. Yeah. <laughs> she no. would have been like, no, we're going. You're waterproof underneath all those clothes. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. Um, they decided to wait and attend the late service when the rain had stopped. Oh, nice. While serving tea to the children in the dining room, she notices a pair of gloves sitting by the window. Ooh. And she remembered that, oh, those gloves need some stitching done. Oh, all right. She walks over to the window to retrieve the gloves. And upon standing back up, she's looking right into the face of a strange man looking through the glass. Horrifying. Yes. That's a jump scare. (laughs) Yes. His stare was just as intense as before. Like camping. It was the same man. Oh, boy. After a moment of staring into her eyes... He seemed to be looking at something behind her, right? Mm -hmm. A shock went through her as she realized the man had not come for her. She bolts out of the house into the rain and runs to the terrace where the man was standing, but no one was there. Of course not. Of course not. Dumbfounded, she stands where the man stood just outside the window, hoping to understand exactly what the man might have been looking for. So she's right where he was. Yeah. Getting perspective here. Yeah. Mrs. Gross comes into the dining room and just as she had done, noticed the gloves, walked over to the window, reached down to pick them up. And when she straightens, gives a start at the sight of someone standing outside the window. Naturally. Double jump scare. One for comedic effect. This this is a little confusing. Okay. I mean, not confusing. It's frustrating. Sure. (laughs) The governess wonders why Mrs. Gross would be afraid to see someone outside the window. Bruh. I know. I'm like, (laughs) I didn't understand that. You! You literally just did that. You! Uh, Oh my gosh. I think it implied that, like, seeing a familiar face outside the window... Would make it better? I guess. Okay. that's not how she phrases it. No, and that's also not true necessarily. Yeah, no, it's like... like, You showed up outside my window, like, (laughs) tomorrow night? 
it's a face in the dark rain. Yeah. Like, you're just going to be scared no matter who it is. Yeah, it's like a Maroon 5 song. <laughs> uh, so the governess explains to Mrs. Gross everything she has experienced. Because okay. Mrs., Mrs. Gross is like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And she's like, there was someone here, and I saw him earlier at the tower, and I don't recognize him, and all that stuff. I'm glad she's finally telling someone. So she describes a stranger. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> number one, he had no hat on. Right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's the, yes, the very big concern there. Important. As soon as you, like, told... Uh, Especially in the rain. As soon as you told the police that, they're like, oh, we saw that rascal earlier. There was only one man <laughs> with no hat. We've got him. <laughs> so he had no hat. He had short, curly red hair. He had a long, pale face. A wide mouth, but thin lips, and he had very sharp eyes. So he's just an average ginger. Basically. He did have a little scraggle around his, his lips, though, they said. I, it, it was phrased weird. They said around the lips. I'm guessing he just had some, like, five-day growth or something. Yeah. Or something like that. A little peach fuzz. Yeah. Mrs. Gross asks if he was handsome and sharply dressed. The governess says, yes, but the clothes were not his own. Huh? Were they sized weirdly? It doesn't say. <laughs> How? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe gingers have a specific uniform they have to I, wear. I don't know. I don't, she, that's an interesting statement to make. She is 100% positive that the clothes he was wearing did not belong to him. Okay. There's a few things in this book that she just seems to intuit. Yeah. And there's no explanation for. I choose to believe they were sized weirdly. That's what I'm thinking is like maybe a little loose on the shoulders or something. Yeah. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Mrs. Gross says... They are the master's clothes. Uh, Mrs. Right. <laughs> Mrs. Gross admits that she does know this man. His name is Peter Quint. Oh, that's a cool name. Yeah. And uh, he was the valet. But oh. he died. Oh. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, wh- no. Mm. Okay. 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 So, valet died. Yeah. This person seeing the valet mm-hmm. tells the other staff member in the house. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh, yeah, that's him. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they're both like, holy shit. Oh, she is freaking out. A little bit, yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought she was just like, oh, yeah, he's the valet. He hangs around. No, I'm sorry. I was a little bit too casual. Okay. Okay. She was like, oh, my goodness. That's the valet who died. All right. That sort of thing. Okay. Right. Okay. (laughs) Long as there's some concern there. Right. No, there definitely is. All right. We're good. Uh, I'll try to match the tone from here on out. I apologize. That's fine. It's fine. (laughs) Um, So they talk about this. Uh, and the governess believes that Quint is after Miles. All right. Okay. Don't ask me exactly how she came to that conclusion, but that's just one of those things where she's like, oh, yeah. she just knows he's after Miles for yeah. some reason. According to Mrs. Gross, Quint spent a lot of time with Miles and was much friendlier to him than anyone else. Ooh. Bad touch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Quint had been found on the road from the village mm-hmm. with a head wound. And it was concluded that he had slipped on the ice and died that way. Brutal. So unlike the previous governess. Yeah. They found his body. Right. It's like definitely dead. Definitely dead. Absolutely. Definitely slipped on the ice. 100%. Uh, Later, the governess is sitting next to the lake. Um, There's, they call it the lake, but it's not a lake. It's just, it's a body of water outside the the mansion. Sure. It's like a fucking pond. Yeah. So she's sitting next to the lake and the children are playing there. They have a little wooden boat they're Aww. doing, you know, uh, when she sees someone standing on the other side oh boy. of the lake. Okay. Here we go. A woman in black. Ooh. Uh, Flora also sees the woman, but doesn't react at all. That's, uh, that's very interesting to me. Not that she doesn't react, but that she also sees the woman. Exactly. Yeah. She just that's... looks up, looks at her for a couple seconds, goes back to playing. That's something I'm trying to keep an eye out for. Uh, the woman stares at Flora with a kind of determination on her face. Don't react to this. Uh, I I choose to believe this is the governess. That's my theory. Okay. Move on. The previous governess? The previous governess, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the not dead, dead one. Right. Yeah. Okay. The governess is hysterical. Naturally. And goes to Mrs. Gross for comfort. They're kind of friends at this point. Yeah. They're their confidants. Right? Yeah. They're the only one that she's talked to so far that's right. like actually been a character. They They more or less shared an experience. That's true. That's like, true. Pretty close. Yeah. Right. The governess believes that the woman she saw is the previous governess. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, her name was Miss Jessel. Jessel. This is chapter seven. This is the first time we got her name. Oh, wow. Jessel. It's an interesting name. Turns out Miss Jessel and Peter Quint were an item. I knew it. 
Uh, this is from Mrs. Gross. Yeah. Explaining this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she was like, they were both scoundrels and they deserved each other. Look, they were fucking all the time. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you watch the show. Oh. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. Uh, later, as the governess and Mrs. Gross talk more, the governess learns that Miles spent hours a day with Quint. Mm-hmm. As if he was his tutor. See, that's that's what I was thinking. You said he, he when he appeared, he was looking in the window past her. I, I think he was looking at Miles. Or, well, right. I thought it was the kids, but... Right, right. Yeah. And now the governess, the old Je- Jessel, mm-hmm. is looking at Flora. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. When Mrs. Gross asks Miles about it, he lied. This was back before. Right, right. So she's like, you're spending a lot of time with Quint. What's up? And he's like, yeah. I'm going to spend a lot of time with Quint. What the fuck are you You've talking been about? spending time with Quint. What do you mean? <laughs> Quint? Who's Quint? Uh, so to to the current governess, she never gets a name. She's yeah, just the, the governess. governess. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to the current governess, this is proof to her that, ooh, they're not perfect children. Yeah. This is a front they're putting up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the main character, I think, is, like, pretty smart. Yeah, and that's for a totally fair part. assumption. For for the most part, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, there, there's something she brushes off. But throughout this book, she never lets fear get the better of her. Oh, cool. She always acts, uh-huh. and she always does her duty. And nice. it's, like, as honest as possible. It's, like, uh, this... We'll get into it later, but yeah, I think I've got this some, is... Yeah, I've got some questions for you about that at the end. This is by far but... the best female protagonist I've ever seen in a book, probably. Mm, there we go. Like, fucking ever. Okay. Um, so the governess decides to just wait and watch, right? right. Yeah. She's like, she doesn't know where these... They're not in immediate danger. Right. And she doesn't know where these, quote unquote, dead people are yeah. or where they're coming from, but she needs more information. She, she has nothing to act on right now. Yeah. She would study the children, especially Miles, and keep an eye out for the supposedly dead former employees. While talking with Miles one day, she got the vaguest impression that he was operating under an influence of some kind. Ooh. Just not acting like a kid should act. Yeah. Right? But it was really, really subtle. She couldn't put her finger on it. Mm-hmm. She noticed that her pupils had some kind of understanding where one of them would occupy her while the other would slip away for a short moment. Oh. That's not nice. Like no. Reassuring. That's very... <laughs> That's very interesting. That's concerning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're really running a, uh, they're running a bootlegging operation in the basement. Yeah. There's yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Step away and make sure the brew is good. Exactly. <laughs> Why does the whole house smell? <laughs> That's the noises she hears at night. It's down <laughs> them down there maintaining their machines. Uh, one late night while reading a book in her bed, the governess senses a stirring in the house. This is also one of those things that's just like her intuition. Yeah. She's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. There's somebody moving around the house. I mean, that's, I, I can't explain it. That has become a horror movie trope. Like, exactly. like somebody's in the bedroom, something's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sent a disturbance. <laughs> in the falls. In my wallet. Uh, she puts her book down and takes up a candle. Yep. So the house is like pitch black except for this one candle. I, I can see the imagery in my head right yeah. now. It's, I choose to believe it's a three stick candlestick. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Almost like Lumiere from... Beauty and the Beast? Uh, I mean, I would, I would take that with me. More like a candelabra. Like, like three is better than one. So yeah. Might as well. Yeah. Uh, she walks into the passageway and she closes the door to her room behind her and locks it. Mm-hmm. Okay. She walks along to the lobby and she, she seems to be guided by something she can't explain. She, she's going somewhere, but she doesn't know where or why. Mm-hmm. She's just moving. She reaches a tall window that's located over the staircase. So she's in the lobby yep. on the second story, mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of like a balcony. Mm-hmm. There's a tall window over by the staircase that kind of does a winding around thing. Yeah. And the window's open. Oh. A gust of wind from the open window blows out her candle. And she is in near... Good thing she's got two more. <laughs> but unfortunately, she is in near perfect darkness. Right. Um, I think there's a, a something about like it's close to dawn, so there's some light outside. Okay, I thought you were going to say it's like two or three in that witching hour. I mean, that's what I thought, but, but then it says that, so I'm like, damn, okay. she's been up for a while, yeah. like reading her book. Um, but yeah, there's like a little bit of light coming in outside, so she can barely see, right? Yeah. Her candle just went out, and she sees the shape of a person walking up the staircase. Oh, that's horrifying. It was Quint. She just somehow knew it was Quint. Do anything. <laughs> say, shout, scream, He's- punch. He sees her uh-huh. and stops. Well, she had a lit candle. Well, it went out, though. Yeah, just right seconds before this. Right. I imagine he saw the light. Well, maybe. He didn't seem to react until it yeah. went out, and then he just got, you know, close uh-huh. to her. Uh-huh. Right? And this is like, this is like fucking 10 feet from each other, though. Yeah. Really close, right? Yeah. 
But she just knows somehow it was Quint, but she can only really see the profile, right? Mm -hmm. He sees her and stops on the staircase, staring at her like he did twice before. You're right. It's just this intense, unblinking stare. Like camping. Like camping. It was a human presence. She was sure of that. Okay, sure. So she's like, this can't be a ghost. Like, this is a living person right here in front of me. Right. Yeah. He was as real as anyone else standing in front of her. No one else is standing in front of her. If they were, <laughs> it would be the same experience. Uh, she was not afraid. Uh, and it kind of notes that she thinks this is odd. She doesn't feel afraid in the moment. Okay. Um, she's very, very cool headed right now. I'm not. I'm freaking out. I would fucking, I would like kick him down the stairs and run. Yeah. I would just, yeah. <laughs> just start running. Um, so there's an open window next to you. Just yeet him out. Yeah. Why not? Why not? She was not afraid and she met his gaze. So they just, <laughs> they just stared This is at Tim. You. This is Frank. This is Fred. Oh my. <laughs> These are my gaze. <laughs> so they're, they're staring at each other and he's just like, Hey, what's going on? Not literally. No, nothing is said between them. Yeah. Right. Uh, this goes on for a fucking while. Like okay. four minutes. Wow. Of just staring at each other, <laughs> saying nothing. I wouldn't be able to stand there silently for four minutes. I think I would say, do you mind if I just sit down? If we're going to, if we're going to do this, do you mind if I just sit on the <laughs> stairs right here? Okay? She, she notes that the only unnatural horror was the prolonged silence. What about the dead guy standing in front of you? Is that unnatural and horrifying? Uh, well, at this point I think she's just like, well, he's obviously not dead. Right. She he's thinks just, he's a normal man. Yeah. Except so. you've been told he's dead. But yeah, no, she's like, it's like any normal person would say something. Literally. So why can neither of us speak? Like, why is this happening? Why are she we just can't speak? It? Um, she doesn't seem like she can. Okay. But it's also, she's not making an effort to. Well, that's my point. She's, she's just like, I don't want to speak. I don't like, it's just like, it's not in her brain right now. I don't agree with All that. All she's going to do is just stare at him. Right. I don't like this. Um, I'm just saying I something is affecting her, Look, right? You're right. I get it. I understand, <laughs> but I don't like it. After this, like four minutes, yeah. Quint then turns around and walks down the staircase. Push him. Push him in the back. And he fades into the darkness. God damn it. The governess turns and walks back to her room. I would walk <laughs> up the stairs backwards facing the staircase behind me. I would trip and fall right. and I don't care. Um, she's also walking in the dark. That's pretty scary. That is pretty scary. Well, she doesn't really have a choice. Um, it, it, it's after she leaves the lobby and he leaves that she actually starts feeling, feeling scared, right? Okay. Her coolness yeah. is gone now. Yeah. Um, which every time something scary happens, she's pretty cool and then is scared afterwards, yeah. which is important. Yeah. I mean, just in real life, that's an important thing. Yes. <laughs> you shouldn't be, uh, not that you shouldn't be scared, but you shouldn't be controlled by your fear. Right. And I don't think there's ever a moment in the book where she is. Mm -hmm. She's always pretty cool when things like happen. those people who, uh, in emergency situations, there's people who panic and freeze right. and then there's people who keep a level head and then deal with it later. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm personally, I'm very like dissociative when something happens. Mm -hmm. So I seem like I'm cool, but really my brain just fucking ejected. And it's like <laughs> only the bare essential systems are operating right now. And so I just, I'm like very flat when things are going down and yeah. just trying to figure out what I should do. Yeah. And then afterwards, people are like, man, you were cool as a cucumber. And I was like, I was freaking out somewhere else yeah. when that was happening. <laughs> my, uh, my instinct is usually to be like, okay, where can I be the most helpful? And the answer is almost always out of the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye. So she turns to go back to her room. But on the way, she passes Flora's room. And it's this thing where, like, the bed has this little curtain that goes around it. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. old rich people things. Yeah. And the curtain was in place, but she could see that Flora was not in bed. I think it's kind of like in like a, a, a what do you call it? opaque mm -hmm. curtain or something, so she could still see through it. Yeah, but there was nobody in the bed. That would be translucent. Opa whatever. Opaque means solid. Yeah, fucking. I don't. Whatever. <laughs> she was standing by the window. Flora was. Well, that's how you know she's not in bed. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so she had to walk into the room. And oh, I her. see. Okay. Um, but she had. She was like behind the curtain. So she could see her little feet. Oh, yeah. So it was like she was hiding, but she was facing out the right, window. Right. She's a, yeah, yeah. So it was a little, little weird. She tells the governess that uh, she thought that the governess was walking on the grounds outside. Oh. That's why she got out of bed and looked out the window, right? Well, I bet the governess was walking on the grounds outside. I just bet it wasn't <laughs> our governess. <laughs> uh, the governess asks Flora if she saw somebody walking outside. And Flora says, uh, no. Just thought you'd be out there. Just thought for some reason you'd be out there, you know? 
Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, the governess is not like, okay, now she's lying to me. Yeah. Like, this is ridiculous. Uh, this is where it just kind of mentions some shit and doesn't go into detail, but it says later at another time, I saw what appeared to be the woman in black sitting at the foot of the staircase, sobbing into her hands. Hmm. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> That's where I was like, God damn it. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, Come on. exactly. Uh, and it also says that she just disappears, but it doesn't elaborate. It doesn't say if she fades away or if she turned her like head for a second and looked back and she wasn't there. That's what I choose to believe happened. That's what I think happened, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't elaborate. It's just like, oh yeah, I saw her on a staircase and she was gone. She didn't feel so good, Mr. Stark. <laughs> So Flora continues to like stand by the window at night, mm -hmm. right? And the governess keeps like peering in and seeing this. What right? you doing? The governess thinks that she can hear Flora softly speaking to somebody. Oh, hell no. Nah. While standing at the window. Yeah. So she's like, oh, there's obviously somebody outside she's talking to, right? I mean, not necessarily, but yeah. Uh, and there's a second story. So yeah, somebody down lower. Mm -hmm. One night she decides she's going to enter the tower in hopes of catching a glimpse of the meeting through one of its windows. Um, and th this is kind of like logistically you would have to get to a spot that's further out from right. the building yeah. to see yeah. somebody below the window. Right. So that's her idea. She's like, I'm going to go down to the tower. It's got a window that you can see the entire side of the house on the lawn. Mm -hmm. I'll go do that. Now this is the tower that she saw. Yes. Quint in. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Same one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm, I'm piecing it together. <laughs> uh, so she does this. She goes to the, one of the windows. It's about halfway up the tower. So she sees a figure standing in the grounds, but it's not looking up at Flora's window. Mm -hmm. It's looking at her. Oh. But no, not at her, but at the tower. Whatever this thing or person was, was looking at something or someone above her on top of the tower. Mm -hmm. And from this, she concludes that man must be standing on the tower. And that's what this figure is looking at, maybe. It's a natural assumption. She then recognizes the figure on the lawn. Mm-hmm. It was Miles. Oh, that's not what I thought you were going to say. So this is around midnight. Yeah. Miles is outside the house. Yeah. Talking to Flora through the window. Now she hasn't seen Miles out of bed, right? She's only seen no. Flora out of bed standing by the window. Exactly. Okay. Neither of them should be out of their room after dark. You're right. So like, yeah. Yeah. This is a, not good, but not something that she'd been led to believe. Right. Interesting. The governess immediately goes down and retrieves Miles, taking him to his room. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. She marches right out there, says, you shouldn't be out here. You're going back to your room. Uh, and they don't say anything to each other on the way back. Right? Yeah. I, I would have two words for him. What? The fuck. <laughs> you don't say fuck to a kid. I would. Okay. <laughs> uh, so she takes him back to his room. There, she implores him to tell her why he went outside. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Right? It's like, what is going on? Please tell me. He tells her that they're not as good as they seem. The kids aren't. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He's like, me and my sister, we're not the goody two-shoes you think we are. We've seen some shit, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back in Nam. <laughs> I've seen my best friend's head explode, man. You don't fucking know, man. <laughs> so. <laughs> this kid's like 11, right? He's like 10. Oh, 10. Yeah, 10. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Miles starts telling her some stuff. Uh, they're not as good as they seem. Mm -hmm. They scheme together. Naturally. And they can be naughty if they wanted to be. That's just children. Right. But it's, it's almost like a malevolent way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Because most kids are like, I just, I just want to go outside. Like, wait, wait, you care. I want to go outside. But they're like, we're doing it because we can. Look, I'll fuck you up. <laughs> I'll cut a bitch. Come on. <laughs> um, so from, from what he says, this is kind of weird. And it took me like the whole book to really get it. Yeah. Okay. But basically what he's saying is they want freedom and this is their little rebellion and how they're getting away with it because mm -hmm. they're like, you distract her. I'll go do something that I want to do that I can't normally. Okay. And then okay. I'll come back and relieve you. And that then way you can we, go do your thing. Right. We can both be naughty and not get caught. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, um, I, I'm down with that. And I'm using naughty because that's what it says in the books. So yeah. I'm just going to say that. Look, it doesn't have a sexual connotation. Exactly. So like th they just care about their freedom. Yeah. They, they want the freedom to, to do what they want to do because they're little rich shits. I can respect that. <laughs> uh, this explains how he got expelled. Yeah. A little bit. Like he definitely was doing some shit yeah. and got caught. So there you go. Again, maybe write to the guy and ask. Yeah. <laughs> he literally could have just been like, 
this is what happened. Yeah. Just so he should have told her more detail. Well, he should have told the father more detail. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the uncle. Who was the he? Uncle, uncle, uncle. Yeah. Should have told the uncle more details. But then when the uncle passed it off to the governess, she should have written him and asked for more details mm-hmm. because literally do anything. Right. Take care of the kids. Yeah. Don't just <laughs> assume they're angels because they're not. Right. No matter what. No Look, kid is parents, angel. if your teacher tells you that there's something wrong with your kid and your kid's misbehaving, don't take your kid's side for it. Right. Listen to what the teacher's saying. Yeah. At least, at least consider it. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. Get both sides of the story. So... That that's the end of chapter twelve. Chapter thirteen, the entire chapter mm-hmm. is her inner thoughts. Okay, that and seems part for the course. I haven't written any notes for this chapter because oh. it's literally her. Like, what do I do? Like recounting what happened and kind of yeah. She's like just thinking of the various aspects yeah. of her situation, and she's like, well. I can't tell the boss about this because he'll fire me for right. bothering him. I have to try to resolve this on my own. Yep. Maybe I should write to the school and ask him. I don't know. You should have done that ages ago. <laughs> yeah. That uh, shouldn't even be a question. So that's all chapter 13. It's chapter 14. The governess has a conversation with Miles one day as they walk to church. Uh-huh. This is some days later. I'm not sure how much longer. More like but, Sundays later. Yeah, so, something like that. Uh, and she notes that every now and then he will say something that just has a catch to it and and that's not how we would say something has a catch to it what she means is something catches her attention so there's there's a little hitch right hey i was riding horses one day and you know we were just taking them out of the field anyway do you like the taste of blood anyway we yeah, were just like- going on and it was kind of <laughs> cool but it was like a really hot day that i mean that's pretty much that except like way more subtle yeah he'll just say like a word that's a little odd like how do you know that word paramecium or, like, or uh Oh, there's a, there's a, the, one of my favorite words is in this book, which Ooh. is, uh, lugubrious. Ooh, lugubrious. <laughs> lugubrious. I love that. That is word. a good word. Um, but he'll, he'll, the way he talks is just a little odd. Yeah. And she still can't put her finger on it, but he's doing it more. He's calling her my dear. No, oh, I hate it. I, I do too. At first she's like, oh, it's endearing. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, Yes. Uh, but yeah, no, he'll just be like, oh, well, whatever is the matter, my dear. Okay. Which I was over immediately. Uh huh. I was like, uh-huh. fuck off, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, but every, things he will say will just prick her mind in an odd way. Uh, he asks her if his uncle thinks about them the way that she thinks about them. I have no idea. I met him once and he told me not to talk about you. Uh, well, she tells him, I don't think your uncle cares much at all. That, I agree. Miles tells her that he will make him care. Oh, boy. All right. Okay. I and, will make it legal. And there was uh, there was a little bit between Mrs. Gross and um, the governess, which I didn't write down, which is like, because the, the governess is like, we we need to get the uncle, the you know, the master, they call him. Yeah. We need to get the master here to talk to his kids. Right. Because I, I don't think we're going to get through to them. Right. And so here, Miles says, I will get him to visit Bly. Ooh. He's very like confident yeah in his ability to do things yeah what's the phrase cocksure yeah so the governess sees this as an ultimatum because she her options were to write to the master yep tell him what's going on Uh uh-huh which she was explicitly told not to do right but if she doesn't do that miles is going to do that that's fine in either case she could be fired because he doesn't he doesn't want to be bothered even if it's his niece and nephew he does not want to be bothered Okay. So if she permits that to happen, he might just fire her. All right. Okay. That doesn't so, sound like the worst thing in the world to me this, at this point. But the way he says it to her is like he knows her situation. I see. So she sees it as an ultimatum yeah. from Miles, yeah. his 10-year-old. Well, it's like, if you're not going to say anything, I'm going to say something. And we'll see what happens. Right? <laughs> the goofy, I'll fucking do it again. Yeah. He's, he's kind of power tripping a little bit. A little bit. But he's doing it to where he has like full deniability. Right. right. He's just in a way that's like. I didn't mean that. Nah. Or, or like, oh, yeah, it's just something like that. Yeah. So th- this is a little confusing, but she decides that she should just leave <laughs> like quietly. That's fair. <laughs> she was like, I'm, I think I'm going to lose my job either way. So I might as well just leave and not tell anyone. Leave on my terms. Uh, and, and this makes her really sad because she loves these kids. Yeah. And she doesn't know why they're acting the way they are. And she doesn't know how to help them. And she doesn't know what to do. Adorable little scamps. So she actually sits at the foot of the stairs and sobs into her hands. Oh, God damn it. The same way uh-huh. the other figure did. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. As she walks to the doorway. All these squares make a circle. <laughs> 
So she gets herself together and, and she starts walking uh, to the school room, mm-hmm. which is it's the, the playroom where she also teaches the kids, right? A little common area. And as she gets to the doorway of the school room, thinking about what she'll have to take with her, because she's like, I need this stuff. I need this stuff. I can't, you know, yeah, I, I have to leave some stuff behind. I got to take some other stuff. So she's in the middle of thought. She goes to the doorway of this school room and she sees the horrible woman sitting at her table, Miss Jessel. Ooh. She's not in the shadows. She's not at a distance. She is right there in her face. The former governess gives her an indignant look and fades into nothing. Oh. They're fucking ghosts now. Yeah. <laughs> They're just ghosts. Yeah. Um, but it talks about how her look is like, you don't belong here. I belong here because she was the first governess. Good. I'm leaving already. Yeah. <laughs> I am literally packing. She's like, ah, it's all yours. I'm out. Bye, bitch. It's at this confrontation. That the governess decides she cannot leave in good conscience. <laughs> she kind of screams after the, the, the wraith or whatever. Yeah. It's like, you vile, horrible woman. Just yells that. You know nothing about her. I mean, she looks vile and horrible. Oh, does she? She does. Oh. So every time she shows up, she's like, she has the most horrible look on her face. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah. Okay. So she's going to stay. She's not going to leave. All right. She talks with Mrs. Gross about her plans. She believes Quint and Jessel intend to take the children from her. That's a logical plot. I agree. They're they're, they're after the kids. They're going to do something. They're doing something. to stop them. Uh, So at this point, she is like, I have to write to their uncle. Mm -hmm. This, like, if I lose my job or not, they are in danger. I need to do this. Look, we got fucking ghosts, man. And we got fucking ghosts. Hey, shove off, hoser. (laughs) You don't belong here no more. So the governess goes to Miles' room one night. And she listens at the door. Mm-hmm. Like, what's, what's this guy up to? But he hears her and tells her to enter. Come in. Basically. He's kind of like, who goes there? And she's like, oh, it's me. And she's like, ah, oh, my dear, come I in. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I still don't like it. Uh, so they talk for a while. You know, she's like, you're, you're not sleeping? He's like, no, I was just thinking. Yeah. And then they just sit and talk with a candle between them. And Miles is talking even more oddly. Mm. Just, just. He doesn't even talk like a kid anymore. He just talks like fucking of an adult man. Yeah. For instance. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, in the midst of their talking, I think she asks him a question that, like, it, she makes a note of she overstepped her bounds and just asked a really bold-faced question. Oh. But as soon as she asks that question, a cold gust of air blows the window open and the, the candle snuffs out. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? <laughs> He's like, what'd you say to me, bitch? <laughs> The fuck I am the devil. Me? <laughs> <laughs> now this is the creepiest part of the book. Ooh. So they both shriek. Yep. They're in darkness. Mm-hmm. The governess kind of composes herself and says, oh, the candle has gone out. Clearly. And Miles replies, it was I who blew it out, my dear. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Go on. <laughs> That's the end of that. Oh. Um, it cuts to later. What? Like the next day. Yep. <laughs> That's bullshit. <laughs> that was the creepiest part of the book to me. It's like, what do you uh, mean it cuts? <laughs> you can't cut there. Yep, that was the last sentence of that that p- chapter. Henry, I knew I couldn't trust a man with two names, <laughs> two first names. Uh, so later, like the next day, uh, the governess is with the children in the schoolroom, and they're just dazzling her with their comprehension of geography and mathematics. She's like, these are just the most perfect, smart little kids uh, ever. They're, they're still creepy as fuck. Right, but they're just, they're really smart. They're really fun. They perform plays for her of historical events. They dress up and like do... Cariolus Rex. Just, Henry the <laughs> Fifth. And then Miles... You should see his Charlemagne. Miles begins playing on the piano and singing to her. And she notes that he is just really good at playing the piano. Huh. Somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And then she realizes that Flora is not in the room. Yep. He's distracting her. And she doesn't know how long she hasn't been in the room. Right. Because she has terrible situational awareness, even though they told her what they were doing. I mean, it's two fucking kids. There's yeah. one door. Yeah. <laughs> like. I'm saying. It's not hard. They told her their plan. Right. Uh, but she leaves immediately. She's okay. like, oh, fuck. And she runs out uh, and she recruits the other staff to help her find Flora. Yeah. Uh, and after some time looking, she realizes she's made a huge mistake. Because now Miles is gone. Exactly. She's like, that's what they wanted. Yep. They wanted me to leave the kids alone. Yes. To have their way so that they could be with Quint and Jessel. Yeah, uh, okay. That's a thought. That's a leap. It's, <laughs> well, that, that, she's making a connection between the ghosts and these kids, yeah. right? They yeah. seem to be fascinated with them somehow. Um, 
The governess kind of feels that Flora must be somewhere away from the house. This is another moment where it's like nothing, it's based on nothing. It's just intuition. It's her maternal instinct. Right. She's like, she's definitely away from the house. And the other people are like, how could you possibly know that? And she's like, I know it. So she convinces Mrs. Gross to go with her Mm -hmm. outside the house to search for Flora. Will you go with me? So they run to the lake because Flora enjoyed spending time out there. Uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. And they see that the boat is missing. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's out on the lake. It's not out on the lake. It's not out on the lake. It's completely gone. Oh. Yep. It's under the lake. They search around the water's edge. Uh Uh-huh. They're also searching in the water because they're like, did she drown? Yeah. Like, what's going on? They eventually make their way to the opposite side and they find the boat. It had been drug out of the lake. Okay. Over land Mm -hmm. and hidden, like behind some trees and shrubs and stuff. Oh. And they're like, like, how could she move that boat on her own? Mm Mm-hmm. There's no way. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they assume that since she stashed the boat at that particular spot, she must have gone through a gate that was right there. There's like a fence and then a gate yeah. with a path. And they're like, she must have gone through there. The gate's wide open. It has to be there. So they run down the path and uh, they do find Flora. Oh. She's just kind of standing, watching them as All they right. approach. And she has a weird like fern in her hand. Flora has Flora? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, and, and as Mrs. Gross, like comes up to hug her, she kind of drops it. I thought that would be important later, but it's not. (laughs) What? (laughs) Just holding shrubbery and it's fine. Yeah. No, the fern had nothing to do with anything in the end. So that's just a little, that's a little tidbit for you there. Um, Mrs. Gross is kind of crying as she's hugging Flora. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of crying in this book. Seems like it. But like, she's like, oh, I can't believe we found you. You're so far away from the house. Like we're afraid for you. But as... The governess sees Flora's head over the shoulder of Mrs. Gross. Mm -hmm. She has a whole different look in her face. Hmm. There's something in Flora's eyes that tells her that all pretense is gone. Oh, it's on now. Yep. She asks Flora, where is Miss Jessel? Mm -hmm. Straight up. At that time, she spots the woman in black, Jessel, Mm -hmm. across the water on the far bank of the lake. Back where they were before. Exactly. Yep. Same situation, opposite side. Yep. Right? Looking down at Flora... She was horrified to see that Flora's face was all of a sudden twisted and hateful like an old woman's. That same expression. She now understands why Mrs. Gross said that Flora sometimes looked like an old woman. (laughs) (laughs) This is a little out of nowhere. I think it's mentioned like halfway through the book. Yeah. And then they don't talk about it. So I'm like, I guess that's a figure of speech from back then. Right, right. But then later it's like, oh no, she literally looked like an old woman sometimes. (laughs) Oh. And she just didn't think to talk about that. (laughs) All right. Okay. Yeah, all right. That's fine. She cries out saying like, ah, the old woman, she's across the lake. Look like that. Yep. And Mrs. Gross says, what? What? Bitch, listen. And she's like, the, the old woman right there that I saw. I, I've been seeing her. She's right there. And Mrs. Gross is like, there's nobody there. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. Flora then starts rebuking the governess the governess oh she's saying you're cruel i hate you i never want to like be around you ever again stuff like that right nice kid yeah just all of a sudden yeah mrs gross looking rather dismayed sure picks up flora and takes her back to bly and she kind of gives a look to uh, the governess like i'm not sure what's up but you sort yourself out yeah we're gonna go yeah um, we'll, we'll deal with this a little later, right? I yeah. just want to make sure she's okay. We'll, we'll talk about this. Right. Which Put is, a pin in it. It's, it's kind of heartbreaking for the governess because she was like her, her confidant, her friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she doesn't believe her. So the governess collapse in grief for a few hours. All right. <laughs> That's a long time. It is a very long time. But she's crying because she doesn't know what to do now. Maybe find the other kid. Um, maybe, but eh. Okay. I mean, he calls her my dear all the time. He does. I would just be like, if they find him, they find him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no big loss. <laughs> so she's lying there crying, and then it's starting to get late. The sun's starting to go down, so she gets up and heads back to the house. She goes straight to her room and changes out of her dirty clothes. Uh, it's around 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. She's sitting in the schoolroom at the little hearth. They have their little fireplace. Aww. She's drinking tea by herself and yeah. just in thought. Like, what do I do? As she's sitting there... Miles standing at the door. Oh. He doesn't say anything. Okay. But after a little while, he comes in and sits next to her. Creepy. They don't say anything Mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. They just sit there next to each other. Yep. Just thinking. The following morning, 
Mrs. Gross enters her bedroom. Uh, so she, Mrs. Gross enters the governess's bedroom. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, and tells her that Flora has become feverish and hasn't slept at all. She, oh. She's sick. Yeah. The governess believes that the illness is related to the proximity with Miss Jessel. Right? Sure. It's like that ghost is somehow making her sick now. Okay. I, I, I'm with it. She doesn't voice this to Miss Gross. She's right. Who doesn't like, believe her? Right. So at this point, she kind of realizes that the children kind of have leverage over her now. Yeah. A little bit. Because Miles has the whole expulsion thing that yeah. she didn't tell the employer. And now Flora got out there and got sick because the governess wasn't watching her. Right. So now they both have a way of getting her fired. Right. Uh, and she, this is like dawning on her like, oh, I might be fucked. Mm -hmm. Like these kids. You, you already knew this and we're packing to leave. Right. <laughs> like this is not, your it, situation has not changed really. Just your perception no, of it has. Right. So. So she thinks that these ghosts want to get rid of her and they're using the kids. To I agree. Do that, right. I, 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 yes, yes. That is a, yes. The governess believes that, uh, it may be too late for Flora, but Miles still has a chance. Right? She needs some milk. And, and Miles may want to talk about it. Oh, has he ever wanted to talk about anything? Well, he, he's very chatty mm -hmm. and he talks about some things, but he's always, always very careful not to say the wrong thing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But. He definitely really likes the governess. Oh, okay. And, okay. and he enjoys being with her and talking with her. My dear. So, so the governess is like, that's my only option yeah. is I have to get through to Miles and try to help him. Mm -hmm. The governess asks Mrs. Gross to take Flora away from Bly. She's like, look, she's sick. Just take her to a doctor in London. Just, you know, yeah. get her away from the place. Like if I could ask anything of you, just get her away from this house. Yeah. Um, and you can bring her back in a couple of days if she changes scenery, should do her right. some good. Uh, and at this point, Mrs. Gross kind of confesses that even though she hasn't seen anything, she has often heard horrible things come out of Flora's mouth. Oh, a great time to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and she's like that. No little girl would say anything like that. Like she used she's... the N word. <laughs> <laughs> what? An income poop. Yeah. Oh my God. So yeah, just hor like the exorcist type shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mother sucks cocks in hell. That sort of thing. Do you ever watch the exorcist? No. If you watch it now, it's probably just hilarious. Yeah. But I watched it when I was like, I was still a teenager and I was still like super, very much Christian and mm -hmm. it scared mm -hmm. the shit out of me. Yeah. Um, cause you know, you believe that demon possession is real. So it's like, it's terrifying. Right. Right. So Mrs. Gross is on her team now. And all it took was what? I, I don't know. Nothing <laughs> from Mrs. Gross's perspective, nothing changed between I, I, Flora screaming, you're a terrible person. And now I think it, it's like something she must have said something during when she was sick that cinched it for her. Right. Could, it could be that. I think it also it, it could be that the governess has shown that she really does care for the kids by telling her to take Flora away. Right. It, it, something like that. So something has shifted where she's like, I have to tell you. This, yeah. So I, I think there's something going on here. I don't know if what you're seeing is real, but something is happening. Right. So. Right. Okay. So the governess had written a letter to the master about everything that had happened. Yeah. Uh, but the man responsible for taking the post to the village never got the letter. Oh, nice. Of course not. Um, which this is fucking incredibly stupid now that I'm thinking about it. But the governess wrote the letter and set it on a fucking table and just told the guy, hey, when you take the letters, take that with you. Oh. Just right out there in the open. Yeah. Uh, and it disappears. Yep. And the man is like, I don't know where it went. Maybe just write another one. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, the governess supposes that Miles must have taken the letter and destroyed it. That's kind of what I thought. Mrs. Gross takes Flora away, uh, you know, out from Bly. Yeah. And the governess goes to have dinner with Miles. Mm-hmm. They have mutton. Oh. Just thought you want to know. Yeah, I, I appreciate a good mutton. Miles asks her if Flora is very ill. The governess tells him that Bly has ceased to agree with her. And Miles asks, well, why so suddenly? You know, because she's lived here her whole life. Why is it now suddenly becoming an issue? Maybe because there's two ghosts that y'all are <laughs> hanging out with. She says, it's not as sudden as you might think. Mm. This has been uh, in building, the works. building for a while. Yeah. And he says, well, if it's building for a while, why didn't you do something sooner? It's a very, very cat and mouse thing where it's like, yeah, we're just kind of talking, but we're saying other things. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so they do this for a little while and then they just start like, they just in silence, they're just eating. Uh, and then Miles stands up and he walks over to the window with his hands in his pockets and he's mm -hmm. just staring out the window. Mm -hmm. And then the maid leaves. The maid that was serving them leaves. Right. 
And Miles turns around and he says, so we're alone now. You like sucking dick? (laughs) She says, not exactly. And he says, well, of course we have the others, but they don't really count, do they? We saved a seat for Jesus. Miles faces, so he's still facing the window. And then he says, well, I'm glad that Bly Manor agrees with me. Oh. Super creepy shit. Yeah, a little bit. So they're, they're going back and forth. That, that, those were the lines I really liked. But then they, they still, you know, go back and forth, go back and forth. Yeah. And it's this whole mental game of trying to get information from each other. And it's, it's one of the more fascinating parts of the book, the way it's written. It's like super, super clever, I think. And it's described in the book. So I kind of have to explain the relationship here. Okay. Because I haven't really talked about it much. Pausers. But throughout the book, they have this relationship building. Miles has a romantic love for the governess. Right. It's kind of obvious. Right. The governess has a love for Miles in the way a mother or an older sibling has. Or a governess. Or a governess, yeah. So the book describes their conversation as two fighters who care about each other too much to strike too close. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of dueling with their questions and answers, but they're not going hard because they don't want to jeopardize each other's, like situation i guess sure it's kind of hard kind of hard to explain but like you literally threatened her earlier but well that's that's the thing that that wasn't really miles miles doesn't want anything to happen to her he wants her to stay quint wants her to leave oh i see that's the situation okay so he's talking to her and it seems like quint is pressuring him but he's trying to keep that at bay and just talk to her honestly okay but he just can't talk to her honestly Right. right right And she wants to help him, but she also wants to deal with this motherfucking ghost. Yeah. So she wants to be tough, but she can't be too tough. Yeah. Tired of these motherfucking ghosts and my motherfucking bly. It's a really delicate situation. Miles is like on the edge of a a knife. Like he could go either way. Right. It's not sure. Right. The governess wants to know what he's keeping secret and Miles wants her to stay. Sure. That's their goals. They gradually through their conversation come to understand this about each other. Mm Mm-hmm. So they're like, "We're, we're not enemies. Where you, I want to stay. You want me to stay. I want to know what you know, and you want to tell me. So just tell me. Exactly. They just gradually come to this. But at that moment, at that very moment. Oh, man. The governess sees Peter Quint walk up to the window on the outside. He just walks in stage left, turns, and is just glaring at Miles. Oh. Just boring holes in the back of his head. Yeah. I'm just imagining that Peter Quint is like pounding on the glass saying, Oh, you little bastard, don't you fucking tell that shit. You hear me? Don't tell her a thing. Now you said the back of Miles' head. So is Miles facing away from the window? Right. He's now facing away from the window. Okay. And they're talking. Okay. Um, and this, th- I didn't write a whole lot down because it's just, it's a lot of drama because the governess is like, please talk to me. Like, yeah, I'm begging yeah. you. And then Miles is like, I can't, I just can't like. It, it, it looks like he's in pain when he's yeah. talking, right? There's this whole supernatural struggle there. And it's, it, you could almost see like a cord connecting him to Quint, right? Mm-hmm. Eventually, Miles admits to taking the letter. And he's like, okay. I, I took it and destroyed it. And I shouldn't have, but I did. Right. And I don't know why I did, but I did. Okay. So chalk went up. We were right. Mm-hmm. And then he tells her about why he's, he was expelled from school. Now he tells her, but he doesn't fucking tell her. Oh. <laughs> this is the most frustrating part of the book because she's like, why'd you get expelled from school? And he's like, I said some things to people I liked and then they spread it around. And then the headmaster found out, but we don't know what those things were. I'm gay. So, maybe, I don't know, but fucking, he said some shit that shit went around. Yeah. Shit always comes back around. Yeah. yeah so yeah. he got expelled for saying that shit. Interesting. But of course it wasn't him saying it. It was probably Quint. Right. Cause he right. wanted him at Bly Manor. Right. Right. So it kind of climaxes to a point where it's almost like very stereotypical exorcism movie where there's shit flying around the room. And there's no shit flying around the room in this part. It's just emotionally, I got the same vibe. It was emotionally flying around the room. Kind kind of. (laughs) Where it's just like there's there's so much struggle and he's like trying. Yeah. And then eventually there's like a snap and he just verbally outright rejects Peter Quint. Oh, nice. And he says, Peter Quint, you devil! And then they they turn around, mm-hmm. and all they see is the quiet, daylit garden outside. Oh. Peter Quint had gone. Uh, and that's the end. 
Oh. <laughs> they don't resolve Flora's bit, but I'm sure she's fine. Because she got away from Bly Manor. Yeah, but I mean, what's her face is still around and she hasn't rejected her, so it's just going to happen again. Maybe. But now we know. Well, I, I choose to believe I'm an optimist, right? Right. So I choose right. to believe like now with Miles being out of the situation, he can help her. The governess knows what's going on right. now. That was a very interesting story. Yeah. No, I I thoroughly enjoyed this book and I love gothic horror. Yeah. So I. Yeah. And, and I know like. Uh, a lot of these things seem tropey now, but this was, of course, like one of the grand. Right. Yeah, so exactly. Was, a lot of things drew off of this. Right. So this was, you know, wholly original. Yeah. And the book spent a lot more time on the kids than the ghosts. I, right. I preferred more ghost action. Right. Well, because the ghost is the mystery, right? Right. So, but um, the most of the, like 60% of the book was just her experience with the kids right. about the kids. Right. Which I didn't find all that interesting because there's a lot of flowery descriptions of how wonderful they are. <laughs> yeah. But but I love the writing of like how creepy they say some things. Like when he was like, my dear, it was I who blew out the candle. Yeah. That, it's just like, what the fuck? So what? <laughs> was it, I don't know if the book explicitly says this or not, but like, was it like Peter Quint possessing him and saying things through him and all of that jazz? Yes. Okay. The idea was that Quint and Jessel were dead. Right. They weren't happy about being dead. Right. They weren't great people when they were alive. Sure. So they manifest as these almost like vengeful spirits that are trying to possess the children so that they can have life again. Okay. That's the okay. idea. Okay. So over the course of time, these kids are slowly changing and yep. they're doing things that they're not doing. Yeah. Right? And just every, and it was at that point that it, Peter Quint was just kind of cutting in and out. So sometimes it would be Miles, and yeah. all of a sudden he would say something that's like, that's not Miles at all. Okay. Right? Okay. So it was like really, really creepy. And then right towards the end, Flora was just like full on Jessel. ghost bitch. Yeah. Right? Yep. So I really, really appreciate the main character of this book. I, I didn't realize until I actually, until we actually went through it together, how many times it was kind of stupid. <laughs> there was a few moments of like, you should have done something. Yeah. Um, I didn't notice that when I was first reading it, but no, there, there's definitely moments where she kind of fell short, but I think she is one of the best female protagonists I've ever read in a book. She, every time she's in a situation where I would be pissing myself, she was fully in control. It seemed like, yeah, there was the moment where she didn't speak, right? but that it wasn't clear whether she couldn't speak or she didn't want to, for whatever reason, that was kind of vague. She was just like. It's odd how neither of us is saying anything. Right. Right. But anytime the ghost shows up or something happens, she just acts first and feels later. Mm -hmm. And th I think that's just awesome. That's like the epitome of courage. It's like yeah. your, your fear is not controlling you and it doesn't ever stop her. Like it's never the fear that stops her. Right. Her low point is when she was like, I'm going to leave because I don't think I can do anything here. Right. Um, but she gets over that pretty like the next day. Yeah. But. But yeah, like she, she is a fucking boss in this book. Like she, she tells everyone what's going on and what to do. She absolutely seemed like it. Like we've, we've dealt with, uh, kind of a search recently yeah. for off books that have good female protagonists. I, I just in listening to the story, I would, she is by far the strongest we've had on the show, yeah. but I agree with you. She's, she's one of the best protagonists that I think I've ever heard, mm -hmm. uh, or read myself. Um, there's a few that I can think of that I have thought of since before, but I mean, she did her job, like you said, and right. she kept her head and she wasn't a stereotypical depiction of an 18th century or well, I guess what 19th century, uh, yeah, late 19th century, late 19th century, yeah. um, female who screams, puts her head and hand on her forehead and faints. Right. Exactly. Like, which is, which is kind of what I was expecting. Yeah, and she she put all the pieces together herself. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was alone in that, and yeah. she got it figured out from what people had told her, just kind of piecing it together. Right. She's brilliant. Yeah, she's, like, fucking smart, say, for one or two occasions, just mm -hmm. in the moment. Well, yes, but, I mean, there's also a time when we have to give the book credit for being a book. Exactly. Right. There's got to be some type of If they took here. the eagles to Mordor, there wouldn't have been a story. Right, so... I, I really appreciate the main character in this book. Yeah. Uh, more than, more than anything. Uh, and the spooks were great. The descriptions, like when she's walking down the hall with a candle. Yeah. Fucking scary. Just the description of where she's at. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I loved it. Did they, did they resolve the weird things? Cause like, 
with the governess, with, with Jessel specifically, we saw her sitting on the stairs crying. Yeah. Then the governess was sitting on the stairs crying. Right. We saw Jessel across the lake staring at the governess. Then later we saw the governess in her position staring across the lake at Jessel. Right. Like, was it ever resolved that it was her seeing herself or is it just happenstance? No, I think it was just just a parallel. Okay. It's okay. like, this is a person who was in my position once. Right. There's a bit of a kind of an empathy there. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that makes that's, sense. that's all that was. I didn't think that was trying to be something deeper. Right. Cause now, I mean, nowadays you have to one up it and everything like that. Yeah, like, so that would that be, that was her. Yeah, exactly. In the future. That's, oh, that's like why, that. that's why I said all these squares make a circle. Exactly. Uh, so. cause that's fully what I was expecting. But with this being like the origination of that, trope for lack of a better word right um no that's that's i like it i like the way it handled it each week on our show we have a rating system uh we rate all of our episodes all of our books uh, on a scale of one to five with one being the lowest five being the highest so one is toilet paper it is not worth uh the pages that it's printed on uh number two being a shampoo bottle uh it's there you read it if you have to you know maybe on the pot something like that it's better than nothing three is an ikea manual uh, it's competently written, but you know, not entertaining, maybe pick it up Four is a Kindle pick, uh, something that's worth getting maybe electronically at a discount, you know, bookshop, something like that. Uh, and then five is a hardcover instant classic. So Jason Voorhees, I remembered. I'm proud of you. Thank you. What would you rate the taming of the shrew? The rating I give this book mm-hmm. is a Kindle pick. Okay. I think it's very close to a hardcover for me. Uh, I think the downside for me, number one, it was written in 1898. Yeah. The English is very dense. Sure. Uh, there were several times I had to stop and look up a handful of words just to get through a sentence. Right. So I'm like, I don't know what's being said here. Right. Um, so the English is very dense because it's old. Um, the writer spends a lot of time describing how wonderful these little kids are. Mm-hmm. And it was excessive. Like, Jesus Christ. So there, there was that. There, there was a couple points in the book that were pretty vague. Um, and I mean, I, I don't mind vague most of the time, but there was, I don't know. There's just a couple that's like, I really would want more information on. Right. That, maybe right? lean into this more. Yeah, yeah. Like, especially like the woman on the staircase is yeah. literally just a mention. Right. And that's it. Right. I'm like, you could have done like a whole page on that. Like, why not? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't get it. So it's uh, just a couple odd choices and just way too much flowery embellishment of certain characters. Mm-hmm. Everything else I absolutely loved. I loved the themes in this book. I loved like the ghosts themselves. Yeah. They were pretty creepy. Yeah. I think the dialogue for the kids was actually pretty good, like pretty, pretty tightly written because it just rode the edge of like, this sounds like a kid, but also not exactly. Like yeah. Which is exactly what it was supposed to be. Yeah. Which was, I thought was really well done. Did I say it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be boss. <laughs> supposed to be. Um, there, there was some things I think I just didn't get because there were some like, I guess like figures of speech that just went way over my head. I mean, it's been really long. It's been over a century. <laughs> yeah. But no, like aside from just uh very, very old English and just yeah. cultural norms that are bygone it, uh, other than that, it, like, yeah, fa- it's a fantastic, solid book. Excellent. And I would recommend anyone who's into horror to read it because it's got some very, big like principles of horror yeah in there well uh if you enjoyed the show you can check us out uh we have a patreon that we uh release bonus episodes every month um we have uh you can write us we have a, our email at a page too far it's a page t-o-o far at gmail.com um we've gotten some suggestions before and actually uh next episode for you guys um i'm going to be looking at one of the books that a, a listener requested uh along with some other things this was kind of a short story but um we're going to be checking that out. So a page too far, gmail.com. We also have our Instagram and Twitter. Uh, check those out. Hit us up on there. Uh, if you want to request a, uh, request a book, request a, an episode, request a topic, something like that. Um, if you want to correct us on something, if you want to give us advice about something, let us know, hit us up. We're here. Uh, if you want it read on air, let us know. If you don't let us know that as well. Oh, and we also came up with a pet name for our listeners. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because we we because we usually if if we get feedback, we want to do a section where we address feedback and we we talk to people that's written in, and we wanted to call that editors' notes. Um, and so it follows by reason to mm-hmm. call our listeners editors. Exactly. Because uh, they they got our back. If we got something wrong, they'll write in. And let us know. Yeah. So 
we're just going to call you guys editors. You have no say in it. We're going to do that. Congratulations, <laughs> editors. You've been promoted. Thank you, editors. We, we appreciate everything you do for us. We appreciate you listening to, to, our, to our dumb show. This show's so much fun. I love this show. <laughs> it is fun. <laughs>